So, uh, hello everyone, Mr. Minister. Um, my name is Mamu Katsaretelli. I'm uh, honored today to um, be the, the moderator of this event. Uh, we'll uh, have uh, this uh, discussion about Georgia and its neighborhood on behalf of Levan Mikheladze Foundation and America Georgia Business Council. Uh, it's a symbolic day, 12 years uh, from the date when ceasefire agreement was signed uh, between Georgia and Russia in 2008. Unfortunately, a uh, major part of this agreement still is not implemented and Russian troops are still uh, occupying 20% of Georgian territory. Uh, like in the previous uh, similar meetings, we'll discuss uh, these and other issues important for Georgia. But we are here also to um, honor legacy of late Ambassador Levan Nikoladze, who is greatly missed by his family, friends, and, uh, and uh, his country, Georgia. Uh, traditionally, uh, like other similar events, uh, majority of speakers today uh, are uh, Levan's uh, friends and colleagues from uh, uh, many years um, in the past. And uh, another objective is obviously to assess uh, strategic position of Georgia, uh, landscape, uh, environment where Georgia is today, US deepening US-Georgian partnership. And um, obviously we'll, uh, we'll focus on uh, some of the important issues, not for only Georgia, but also for all the neighboring countries. Uh, and also to discuss uh, uh, how can we strengthen uh, strategic position of Georgia with bilateral partnership uh, between the United States and, 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 uh, and Georgia. I would like to ask uh, Tina Mikeladze, daughter of Ambassador Mikeladze, to um, briefly introduce foundation. <laughs> Tina uh, resides in, uh, in Houston with her family, her husband, Sergei, son, Nico, and uh, daughter, Nina. And, uh, uh, but they, they are currently in Georgia, so they are lucky. Uh, they will be joining us from, from Tbilisi. Tina, please. Sorry for the background. <laughs> That's um, not Georgia, for sure. I'm sorry, but my kids uh, just changed something. Um, hello, my name is uh, Tina Mikeladze. And I would um, like to welcome you all and thank you for attending our virtual um, conference. This has clearly been a very unusual year for all of us and we really appreciate your time, interest and participation. Special thanks to all our guest speakers and to Mamuka Tzereteli for organizing this virtual conference. I would like to start with a brief background of our organization and of this annual conference. Levan Mikeladze Foundation for Caucasus Studies is a nonprofit organization incorporated in 2015, operating in the United States. Our main mission is to provide platform for research, policy, educational, and uh, advocacy initiatives pertaining to Georgia and Caucasus region. This was a very special cause for my late father, Levan Mikeladze, and I'm honored and very uh, grateful that his legacy and friendship with his esteemed colleagues lives through this organization and through annual event, which usually takes place in Washington, D.C. each spring. Years spent in DC as the ambassador of Georgia was the highlight of my father's diplomatic career and enabled him establish friendships and relationships with many of his colleagues and friends who continue to support the foundation and our annual conferences. Our family and this organization will continue supporting um, discussion, research and dialogue about the region that is rich in history and continues to maintain vital geopolitical, economic, and cultural role. We also work very closely with our sister organization, Levan Mikeladze Foundation in Tbilisi, Georgia, and many other foreign missions, NGOs, and institutions that have special interest and commitments to Georgia and Caucasus region. 
Thank you very much for your participation, interest and support. And we very much look forward to hearing our special guest speakers today. Thank you, Tina. Uh, good to see you again. And uh, Mr. Secretary, I would like to very briefly introduce uh, 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 America Georgia Business Council. I think you participate in the past in a couple of our events. Uh, we are uh, organized uh, about late 90s uh, and we, uh, our mission is to facilitate trade and investments between uh, Georgia and United States. Uh, we uh, frequently get, host uh, trade missions and uh, other conferences and activities here in the uh, United States as well as in Georgia. That's the purpose of our organization. We collaborate very closely to different U.S. institutions. Um, uh, obviously, we work very closely with your Department of State and your very capable staff at, at uh, European Bureau, uh, Caucasus Desk and Georgia, Georgia Desk. We are also closely co collaborating with uh, uh, Department of Commerce uh, and uh, Development Finance Corpor Corporation, formerly OPIC. Uh, OPIC has a very special role in promoting U.S. investments in our part of the world, in Georgia in particular. There are many success stories and many American businesses benefited from OPIC investments in, uh, in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, we um, just recently actually completed a very interesting deal, uh, investments in uh, uh, PACE terminal in uh, Poti, uh, new development that facilitates trade uh, and, uh, and transit through Georgia. And uh, starting from next year, actually in May, we'll have already very high level um, uh, port facility uh, enabling larger trade between United States and direct connectivity between United States and, uh, and, and Georgia. Uh, I think bilateral uh, trade and economic ties as well as political ties are deepening, but we all agree that uh, much more can be done and uh, to deepen business and economic ties between our countries and that's what our uh, focus is. Uh, let me now briefly introduce uh, uh, Secret Deputy Secretary of State uh, Mr. Stephen Began to our audience. Mr. St Secretary, uh, it is, uh, um, we all know very well that you, uh, you care deeply about sovereignty, independence and, uh, and uh, uh, strengths and, and, and uh, success and security of, uh, of not only Georgia, but all our uh, partner countries uh, in, in the neighborhood. But we also know that uh, as an alumni of International Republican Institute, you uh, deeply care about democracy as well. You have a remarkable career in, uh, in both legislative and uh, executive branches. You were national security assistant to Senate Majority Leader. Uh, you been uh, uh, chief of staff for Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, and you worked for the White House. Very interesting times. I just noticed that you were um, actually chief executive officer for uh, uh, National Security uh, Council in uh, early 2000s. It's a very interesting time because that's when uh, train and equip program started for Georgia, and that's very important pro program, obviously for for Georgia's, uh, uh, Georgia's security and uh, uh, military, which actually transformed Georgia's military, as we all know. Um, uh, I, I wanted to also say uh, that uh, uh, as a vice president of uh, Ford Motor Company and third generation Ford employee, uh, you obviously travel the world and understand the world uh, very well, uh, better than uh, uh, obviously many others. And uh, you understand the, uh, not only uh, political, economic, but also cultural aspects of, of uh, global development. So um, one last point I wanted to mention uh, before I complete your introduction, you are from Detroit and uh, I happened to visit your hometown right before pandemic started. And uh, I was surprised and I have good news for you. Uh, Detroit is one of the very interesting uh, wine uh, environments now in, in the United States. Probably people are surprised to hear that, but there's one particular place, Motor City Wine Bar. And next time you are in town, please visit that place and you'll enjoy great Georgian wine there. Without further delay, Mr. Secretary, I would like to introduce, I would like to give you a floor, please. 
Well, thank you very much, Mamuka. Uh, very nice to see you. And, and, and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak here today. Um, as you know, uh, Ambassador Michelazzo was a accomplished diplomat, but he also was an old friend of mine and many others who are on this call. I'd also like to ex express my, um, my warm greetings to his daughter, Tina, and also to my many uh, friends from years past who are gonna participate in the subsequent discussion. Um, the foundation that beer, bears uh, Levant's name has continued his important work to strengthen our relationship between the United States and Georgia. And this, as you said, is a relationship that I myself have supported throughout my own career. It's a partnership built on shared values of individual liberty, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. It's also a per partnership rooted in economic and people-to-people -people ties, which other portions of my career have allowed me to participate in. Levan Mikuladze himself was a Fulbright Fellow in 1994, a shining example of the exchanges that have enriched our countries in so many fields. The United States has and will continue to work together with Georgia to advance a common vision of a South Caucasus and Central Asia region, secure, free of conflict and malign influence, and focused on strengthening democratic governments, governance and promoting economic growth. The recent violence between Azerbaijan and Armenia that erupted in July highlights ever more the need for renewed efforts on conflict resolution in the region. As a Minsk Group co-chair, the United States has urged both sides to adhere to the ceasefire and refrain from provocations. As Secretary Pompeo stressed, the reestablished ceasefire should be leveraged to advance negotiations leading to a final comprehensive settlement. As you mentioned, the recent anniversary of Russia's August 2008 invasion of Georgia is a reminder of what is at stake in our efforts to foster a secure, conflict-free region. The hundreds of civilians that were killed and injured as a result of Russian aggression should compel us to redouble our efforts to press Russia to fully implement the 2008 ceasefire agreement, to reverse its recognition of the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia and its occupation of Georgian territory. Russia must respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all of its neighbors, especially Georgia. At the heart of our engagement with Georgia and our regional partners, our commitment to democracy stands above all. Georgia has been a regional leader in many respects, and we expect our partners in Tbilisi will continue to advance these democratic ideals through the strengthening of your governing institutions. This year's October parliamentary elections will be a critical step in that regard. We have faith that with sufficient political will, the people of Georgia will take the steps necessary to ensure an ever stronger democracy. On the economic front, the United States will continue to work with Georgia to institute reforms and help develop key sectors, including infrastructure and agriculture and hospitality. And to attract foreign investment and sustain economic growth, Georgia needs a truly independent judiciary that guarantees businesses a level playing field and timely adjudication of their disputes. A better connected, more prosperous South Caucasus region in Central Asia is in the interest of both the United States and Georgia. Georgia is uniquely situated to be a transit hub for trade from Eurasia to Europe. Completion of the Southern Gas Corridor and initiatives such as the Lapis Lazuli Corridor will advance these ambitions. Such efforts enable countries in the region to resist foreign malign influence from states that seek to create spheres of influence. We are pushing back against China's One Belt, One Road Initiative and its opaque loans that undermine governance and autonomy. Our goal is to ensure that the countries of the South Caucasus have control over their own critical infrastructure and are able to make independent choices in regard to their security and economic relationships. The COVID-19 crisis is just the latest example of how our partnership with Georgia can make a difference in the lives of our citizens. In my work on the White House COVID-19 task force, I've been impressed by Georgia's efforts to stem the spread of this dangerous disease. Through our long-term cooperation and assistance, Georgia has built strong, sustainable public health institutions. The United States has provided Georgia almost $6 million in COVID assistance, and USAID has directed an additional $13 million to ongoing programs to address the economic impacts of COVID-19 on Georgia. 
We are also quite proud that the Richard G. Luger Center, built through U.S. funding and now owned and operated by the Georgian National Center for Disease Control, has been at the forefront of saving lives and contributing to medical research efforts. It's no surprise to any of us that the Luger Center has been a target of persistent Russian disinformation precisely because the center demonstrates to the Georgian people the tangible results of Georgia's choice to integrate with the West. The United States will continue to work with Georgia to advance this integration, including with the help of the European Union and NATO. Through our deep and comprehensive security partnership, we will assist Georgia in its efforts to strengthen capabilities, to defend its territorial integrity, and enhance its NATO interoperability. In, two, in 2020 alone, the United States provided more than $66 million in military assistance. We deeply appreciate Georgia's outsized contribution to NATO's resolute support mission in Afghanistan, as well as to US and NATO exercises elsewhere. So thank you again for inviting me to speak today and for the opportunity to highlight the United States-Georgia partnership. I hope we can go forward as, back, as Levan Mikuladze would have wanted to build a stronger United States-Georgia relationship in the years to come. And I very much look forward to being part of that effort. Thank you, Mamka. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate your time and participation in this event. Uh, very briefly, let me introduce uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, our good friend, Mr. David Zalkaliani. Uh, David is also a very close friend of Ambassador Mikeladze. He worked with Ambassador Mikeladze in Vienna and then in Washington and throughout the years, uh, of course, uh, maintain a close, a close uh, uh, friendship, but also uh, professional uh, partnership and relationships. Uh, David served as Georgia's ambassador to two important countries, Uzbekistan and Belarus. Most recent assignment as an ambassador was in Belarus, 2008-2009. So he understands Belarus, Belarusian landscape very well, in addition to uh, some other countries. He also served as an as a, uh, embassy colleague here in Washington in the uh, early 2000s. So uh, David represents uh, this first generation of Georgian diplomats who entered uh, 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 their service in the early 90s and already, already almost three decades serves as a as a foreign policy uh, expert and uh, and professional in uh, in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, David, floor is yours. Thank you, dear Mamuka, dear Tina, distinguished Deputy Secretary, Abigan. Uh, I am pleased and honored to have this opportunity uh, to be part of this important online conversation with our friends and partners on Georgia's regional environment and our foreign policy priorities. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Began, for your encouraging and uh, supportive remarks. Uh, my special thanks to the Levan Mikeladze Foundation and uh, uh, America Georgia Business Council uh, for co-organizing this annual conference. Uh, Levan Mikeladze was a, a dear friend of mine. He was among the architects of Georgia's modern day diplomatic service. And his service was notable, especially for his contributions to strengthening the US-Georgia strategic partnership. Of course, today pandemic is uh, the backdrop of virtually all foreign policy considerations. Uh, Georgia itself uh, has been quite uh, successful in containing the spread of the virus because uh, the government initiated effective and preventive actions from the very early stages uh, of the COVID-19. We undertook uh, a holistic strategy that embraced uh, healthcare, education, uh, social policy, the economy, transportation, and tourism. And Georgia's success in the fight against COVID-19 was uh, possible thanks to early preventive measures uh, excellent collaboration with the uh, medical specialists and uh, importantly, effective communication with the society. Uh, as you are aware, in June, uh, the uh, European Union listed Georgia among safe uh, travel destinations and we remain in the list of 10 non-EU um, uh, countries safe to travel uh, uh, to uh, the European Union. Uh, Georgia could not have done this without support and uh, uh, generous assistance of the United States and our uh, European partners. 
uh, our long-term cooperation with the United States in the healthcare sector has been instrumental in Georgia's success against the pandemic. I would note in particular the contribution of our world-class Richard Luger Research Laboratory, which was born with uh, American help. Being online today is uh, emblematic of uh, how foreign policy, like just about everything else, operates in uh, unusual uh, times. Also, we had to postpone on a number of high-level visits and meetings since the crisis began. Uh, we have managed to maintain uh, constant communication with our partners uh, in ways that enhance the positive dynamics of US-Georgia strategic partnership and our European and EU Atlantic uh, integration. The situation in Georgia's occupied regions has been the main focus of uh, engagements uh, with international partners today. Uh, the recent phone conversation between the Prime Minister of Georgia and the US uh, Secretary of State underlines America's support for Georgia and uh, emphasize the readiness of both sides to build upon this robust and mutually beneficial partnership. Nothing will serve this goal better than starting uh, uh, formal negotiations of free trade agreement between four countries. We are absolutely committed to enhance existing bonds while forging new ones. Our very close cooperation and coordination over the years helped us to build a uh, robust and uh, sustainable democracy, making Georgia the most steadfast and capable partner of the uh, West and the United States in the region. Uh, we have uh, dynamic agendas of cooperation in many areas, especially in defense and security, and we'll continue to build upon this very solid par partnership. Uh, the government, together with uh, significant support from our international partners, first and more foremost, the uh, United States, has taken a historic step uh, launching the constitutional amendments and progressive electoral reforms that are based on the best European traditions of the parliamentary democracy and incorporate the OSCOD recommendations. The tremendous efforts and the strong will of uh, Georgian government to increase parliamentary pluralism and allow for more representative legislature for uh, 2020, uh, transitioning uh, to a fully proportional system in 2024 is a vivid demonstration of uh, Georgia's commitment to hold the elections in an unprecedentedly fair, free and democratic environment. I'm absolutely positive that October parliamentary elections will be another step toward Georgia's European and EU Atlantic integration. I'm glad to note that uh, EU Atlantic agenda has also advanced during COVID-19. And in March, I had a phone conversation with Secretary General Stoltenberg to discuss measures to contain the pandemic as well as a, um, the, the, the NATO integration. This was the main uh, topic of our conversation. Additionally, in March, in NATO standing uh, maritime force vessels made a port call to Poti and uh, held joint exercises with Georgian Coast Guard with the aim to further enhance interoperability between NATO and Georgia. Moreover, at the April 4th NATO Foreign Ministerial, allies endorsed package of additional measures on support of Georgia and Ukraine aimed at strengthening Black Sea security and consisting measures such as more active engagement of Georgia and Ukraine in NATO-led exercises and uh, training in the Black Sea. Uh, importantly, Georgia and NATO continued political dialogue and on July 14, I had an opportunity to visit Brussels and participate in NATO Georgia Commission meeting with the allies on the issues related to Georgia NATO integration, regional security environment, conflict related uh, issues, Black Sea security and democratic reforms and the process of uh, in Georgia in the run up of uh, parliamentary coming parliamentary elections. Uh, during uh, these times uh, of pandemic, Georgia has uh, continued its substantial contribution to the resolute support mission in Afghanistan, maintaining one of the highest overall and the highest per capita contingent on the ground. Now coming to our European uh, agenda, as associated partners, we continue working together with the European Union to develop the potential to connect Europe via the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea and beyond and EU-Georgia relations now are the model for EU's power to support the positive transformation in countries that wish to build closer cooperation uh, with the Union. The leaders' dialogue in June 
uh, reach two important decisions to hold the next uh, Eastern Partnership Summit and also to uh, adopt the summit declaration, which will be substantial and forward looking uh, um, text on, of uh, summit declaration. Um, we also highlighted that uh, Georgia's European aspirations and European choice. Um, and we expect that the upcoming summit will expect uh, explicitly uh, also echo this uh, affirmation as uh, a way of uh, delivering strong political signaling to the associated uh, partners. This year also marked uh, by uh, Georgia's presidency of the Committee of Ministers for the first time since becoming a member of the Council of Europe. And despite the challenges caused uh, by COVID, Georgia concluded its presidency with the forward-looking legacy. Uh, this month also marks uh, uh, 12 years since the August 2008 war, the invasion of sovereign country by Russia in an attempt to forcibly withdraw borders in Europe. Uh, nobody questions today that it was a vivid claim of Moscow to retain its influence in the region in response to Georgia's declared aspirations to become a consolidated European democracy, a member of NATO and the European Union. Uh, subsequent illegal occupation of two Georgian uh, regions uh, established a very dangerous pattern which Russia further exploited in Ukraine and elsewhere, causing serious security implications in the whole Euro-Atlantic space. If we look uh, at the map, the entire Black Sea region is now surrounded by Russian military strongholds. The bases equipped with the latest, latest offensive uh, weaponry and uh, constant military exercises in Georgia's occupied territories and uh, illegally annexed Crimea in Eastern Ukraine and Moldovan Transition region cre create extremely concerning picture of uh, European and Euro-Atlantic security. These uh, conventional tools are supplemented with the intensified hybrid uh, warfare targeting Georgia as well as the West as a whole. No doubt that Moscow has a very clear interest in preserving the dangerous status quo in the unresolved conflicts in uh, Europe's eastern uh, frontier. And against this, there is uh, plenty uh, of uh, members um, of the international community who sometimes erroneously assume that absence of armed hostilities in Georgia's occupied territories automatically equals peace. It cannot uh, be uh, farther from uh, the truth, however. For the last 12 years, my country has uh, remained in a state of war facing Russia's continued violation of the EU-mediated ceasefire agreement, which was, by the way, signed today, exactly 12 years ago. Uh, and today we witnessed the continuation of uh, their illegal presence and uh, building up of barbarian fences, artificial barriers across the occupation line, kidnapping, detention of ethnic Georgians, etc. But government firmly pursues the peaceful conflict resolution policy and trying to resolve the Russia-Georgia conflict through dialogue um, and uh, tremendous efforts uh, have been invested in Geneva international discussions in an attempt to find durable solution for addressing this uh, security and human rights challenges on the conflict affected people. However, our steadfast stance to peace and security and compliance with the uh, 12 August 2008 ceasefire agreement has not been reciprocated by Russia to this point. And the reason is simple. You know, Moscow is uh, not showing willingness to engage in meaningful, uh, in meaningful talks and continues to play the role of uh, sideline uh, observer. But despite uh, numerous impediments, the government is uh, implementing the reconciliation and engagement policy to build uh, robust trust between the people across the dividing lines and um, uh, to ease burden of occupation for people in, in Abkhazia and Skidwali region. And our peace initiative, a step uh, to a better future, has served as a good illustration of our uh, very strong commitment. Um, so here, uh, the consolidated international stance uh, that can indeed serve as a deterrent factor for Russia is really important as ever. And we seek our partners in Europe and uh, over the Atlantic to further strengthen their leadership and take decisive steps to counter the illegal occupation in the uh, countries uh, throughout the Black Sea region, in, uh, particularly in Georgia, including through keeping the issue very high in your uh, 
bilateral agenda uh, with the Russian Federation as well as uh, the European security agenda. Now let me turn to the current situation in the South Caucasus and the region. As it was um, rightly mentioned by um, uh, Deputy Secretary Bigan, we also are um, uh, concerned with the recent uh, escalation of uh, hostilities between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, it's uh, yet another uh, burning topic of uh, security of uh, the region and European security as well. And we are very concerned by the recent events there. Um, uh, these are our valued neighbors and we deeply regret the loss of lives on both sides. And both Armenia and Azerbaijan should undertake all necessary steps aiming at the escalation of the situation on the ground. And Georgia stands ready to help in a way it can to achieve this. The proximity of hostilities to major regional infrastructure projects like energy pipelines, transport networks is especially concerning. And we support very active engagement of international community to resolve this conflict, including resuming negotiations with the OSC Minsk Group. Uh, the international community and uh, the OSC co-chair should be um, more active and do everything possible to lead the process and to promote their positive agenda in the region. Uh, promoting regional cooperation has always been among uh, Georgia's top, top uh, foreign policy priorities. Uh, and, uh, and also here I would like to mention trilateral Azerbaijan-Georgia Turkey framework, which is one of good example and we are strongly committed to implementing the Southern Energy Corridor project fully. We share exceptional uh, regional synergies. Uh, um, Azerbaijan's ability to supply growing energy needs, uh, coupled with Georgia's and Turkey's transit capabilities, all this creates a unique opportunity for delivering additional resources to European markets. The inauguration of the Trans Anatolian Natural Gas Pipeline project, um, uh, the second phase of this uh, project, last year by uh, President of Azerbaijan, the, uh, Turkey, and Prime Minister of Georgia, is an, uh, another example of uh, regional cooperation. Uh, when, uh, in this regard here, I would like to welcome yesterday's statement by President Aliyev on the prospects of speedy conclusion of the um, Trans-Anatolian pipeline, making the South Caspian corridor fully operational in the nearest future. We are also close uh, to completing the bakut pilisi Hars railway, which will link Central Asian states to our transportation and communication projects. We have to, uh, we have, uh, enormous interest in the Black Sea, it's obvious, and, uh, and it has crucial significance for Europe uh, as a major crossroads uh, of East and West, where a number of major energy transit and transportation routes um, uh, intersect and where several others are underway. Here, I would like to emphasize the strategic importance of an Aklia Deep Sea Port project uh, duly reflected in our main foreign policy strategy document. Its implementation will only advance the security of the wider Black Sea region. Uh, Georgia continues to be a welcoming place for foreign investment, particularly from the United States. And we are glad that uh, Pace Group recently received the 50 million US dollar funding from the US International Development Finance Corporation for development in the infrastructure of Georgia Black Sea Port Poti. Increased engagement from the United States private sector plays an important role for the development of our transit capabilities and hence boosting the Black Sea economic potential with its positive security um, uh, implications for, 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 for the region. Um, Georgia's Black Sea ports, east-west highways, uh, the large-scale uh, regional infrastructure projects will significantly contribute to the east-west interconnectivity and position Georgia as the fastest economic route uh, connecting Europe mm -hmm. with. Uh, our goal is to fully exploit existing uh, opportunities in, the, in this region, ensure synergy between littoral states uh, that share the same strategic vision and unleash its full economic uh, potential. And uh, we therefore, uh, therefore welcome United States and NATO's engagement in strengthening Black Sea security, which has a strong stabilizing uh, effect for a region and far beyond. Uh, dear colleagues, um, uh, in conclusion, let me summarize uh, our approach um, to the neighborhood and uh, uh, it's uh, once again to reiterate that we seek regional cooperation 
and uh, an end to the conflict between our neighbors. And we'll persist in our journey towards the European Union and NATO, and we'll build mutually beneficial partnership that enhance the security and prosperity of our neighborhood. And we'll connect the dots that link our neighborhood's economic architecture to the global uh, marketplace. We'll forge stronger security and economic bonds with our partners, especially with the United States, because our interests uh, converge at so many points and on so many issues uh, that uh, it's inevitable that this strategic partnership should be strengthened in future as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, and uh, I know uh, Mr. Deputy Secretary is very busy uh, with um, uh, other meetings and plans. Uh, uh, I would like to just uh, request, Mr. Uh, Secretary, that uh, uh, we have some ideas that we want to share with you about some of the priority areas of, of uh, uh, partnership between United States, States and, and, and Georgia. Ideas like how Eastern Partnership may be connected with the 3C initiative. Uh, you had a presentation recently on 3C initiative uh, conference, and uh, we think that Eastern Partnership countries somehow should be connected to this initiative in order to maximize all the opportunities. We also have some other uh, business related uh, requests that we would like to communicate with you um, related to, let's say, with the steel tariffs that the United States has vis-a-vis uh, -vis some importing uh, producing countries and Georgia is tiny Georgia, tiny Georgian producer of steel in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in Rustavi is also affected by that. So we would like to communicate with you a little bit more about some of these priority areas and ideas. I would like to thank you very much, uh, both our, our keynote speakers, Deputy Secretary of State, Mr. Stephen Degan, and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Georgia, Mr. David Zalkaliani, for your uh, valuable uh, contributions to this event and, and in general for your service uh, to the United States and to Georgia and to your contribution to bilateral ties and deepening bilateral ties between uh, two countries. Thank you very much. And we'll now move to our, unless you want to say some final words, Deputy Secretary. No, thank you. Um, I'm kind of look forward to seeing you soon. And uh, we'll be more than happy to sit down to discuss those issues you raised. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. And now we move to our next set, uh, next part of our uh, discussion when um, several our very uh, knowledgeable and uh, experienced uh, speakers will discuss uh, multiple aspects of, uh, uh, of uh, strategic environment around Georgia. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, I would like to invite now Mr. Ambassador Achil Gegeshidze. Uh, Achil, can you join us? Join us. Yeah. Um, Jim O'Brien, Jim Carafano. Ambassador Van Doren uh, and Victor Kipiani. Uh, this will be our next panel discussion. And uh, I think uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs touched some of the important issues in his, uh, in his uh, uh, presentation, mentioning uh, some of the conflict areas uh, and developments there. Ambassador uh, Gegeshidze, uh, he is an experienced diplomat but also a uh, scholar and, uh, and researcher. And uh, he spent uh, half of his career probably being in the government, assisting president of Georgia in the late 90s in national security issues, and then being ambassador to the United States. Uh, but in between, he worked for Georgian Foundation for Strategic International Studies and now leads the Van Mikhailadze Foundation. Uh, he's obviously also a close friends of friend of and classmate of Ambassador Levan Mikeladze. Archil, please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Mamuka, for a nice introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of this discussion with so much impressive line of speakers. And I'm particularly thrilled to represent the organization that proudly bears the name of prominent Georgian public figure and very close my friend very close friend of mine, Leon Nikaladze, and we are a sister organization, as it was already said, uh, based in Tbilisi, and uh, the prim primary mission of ours is to uh, uh, serve the goals and priorities uh, 
uh, of Georgia, which Levan Mikaladze, if alive, would uh, uh, devote uh, his time. And uh, we are trying to align our uh, both research agenda and advocacy agenda and, uh, and, it, and, and work plan uh, to, his, uh, um, to his spheres of interest which he, uh, during his both uh, uh, diplomatic and uh, scholar career, um, uh, displayed and manifested very well. So I, uh, um, I would start by noting that I cannot uh, agree more uh, on that, uh, largely thanks to the transformative power of the massive American assistance. Georgia has become a recognized poster child in the region in terms of democratic reforms and good governance. And it's... Uh, uh, international rankings are constantly improving and America's strong political support uh, at all international platforms coupled with bilateral uh, programs to strengthen Georgia's defense capabilities and general resilience has created conditions for peaceful and uh, stable development. Uh, now from looking from here, uh, the next step is to maintain and ensure the irreversibility of this trend. And here I would like to highlight one major obstacle, which was already mentioned uh, in, um, in the speeches of uh, previous distinguished speakers, uh, the unresolved conflict in uh, Abkhazia, South Syria, and the ongoing Russian occupation of these breakaway territories. Uh, over two decades of hard work by politicians, reputable international organizations, civil society activists, the best minds of the academia and the representatives of the donor community have not brought progress in solving Georgia's conflicts. Of course, the Russian-Georgian confrontation over the status of these breakaway territories aggravates the situation even further. Since uh, 2008, a certain geopolitical parity has been established between supporters and opponents of Georgia's territorial integrity. Uh, and because the uh, rivaling sides are engaged in a zero-sum uh, confrontation, attempts to resolve uh, the conflicts are doomed to failure. And indeed, 50 uh, ineffective rounds of Geneva discussions have already been held. Uh, but Russia keeps uh, turning a deaf ear to calls for the implementation of the six-point agreement and illegal borderization, uh, as well as abduction and violence against the local population continues. Each such case resonates loudly and very painfully in the Georgian society and the only thing left to do is to ring the bells for the international community to react. And this has been going on for many years now and there is no end in sight. Therefore, at least currently, the possibility of resolving these conflicts also remains uh, out of sight. In the meantime, everyone, both immediate stakeholders, such as Georgian side uh, and Abkhaz and South Asian sides and third parties, uh, including international organizations, donors, or individual governments, all continue to pay a price for the existence of these conflicts. Uh, for some stakeholders, this uh, uh, cost uh, is, of uh, is of a geopolitical nature. For some, the cost is economic. For others, sociocultural or even reputational. Taken together, the cost of conflict for all of us is very high and becomes an intolerable burden. But however, strangely, over time, we all got used to paying the cost like utility bills without realizing that the price tag drains our resources of national development. Indeed, when a country develops in a peaceful environment in Georgia has been enjoying uh, this peaceful environment for um, a decade now, and uh, with the economy developing, uh, the overwhelming daily routine along with the rapidly changing world around us mute the feeling of the urgency of the problem and the biting effect of the cost of conflict. On the other hand, it is widely believed that time is working in favor of the Georgian side and that we should uh, all wait with strategic patience for a certain historical moment, something like the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. Mm, this is a false assumption because no one knows when this moment will come and if it does, what benefits it will bring to the unity of Georgia. Meanwhile, the alienation between Georgians and uh, Abkhaz and uh, South Ossetians is deepening on a daily basis, which is inexorably reduced uh, 
reducing the chances of voluntary reconciliation in the future. Moreover, uh, in a more immediate perspective, again, before the historical moment arrives, Russia may have time to annex one or both conflict regions. So the bottom line here is that time is not on Georgia's side. So what needs to be done? Uh, one of the main pillars of the Russian occupation is the almost complete lack of trust between the Georgians and Abkhaz and South Ossetian sides. Therefore, Russia takes a, ch a chance and is actively working towards the alienation of Georgians and Abkhaz and South Ossetians and openly or covertly in interferes with any attempt at rapprochement. We must immediately start destroying this pillar by filling the mentioned gap. In this regard, Georgian government, as mentioned by the minister in his speech, introduced an important initiative, a step to a better future, among others aimed at facilitating tra trade across the ABL uh, with the breakaways. However, we need to do more, much more. And here, whether we like it or not, we must engage with the de facto administrations in Sukhumi and Tsingvali. A direct dialogue with uh, the Georgian side recently proposed by Abkhaz, the politicians, inspires hope. And the mm, new leader uh, of Abkhazia, as he stated, uh, the e issue of recognizing the independence of Abkhazia will not be raised as a precondition for this dialogue. This means one important thing, that in contrast to the Geneva International di Discussions, the proposal, this proposal can be about creating a status neutral platform for dialogue where a politically a non-sensitive agenda can be discussed. If constructive, this dialogue you know, will pave the way to much needed conflict transformation. During and as a result of the proposed dialogue, it is highly desirable that the parties come to a common understanding of the essence of the transformation and develop a common vision of getting uh, to more civilized, that is less violent nature of relationships. If uh, there is a, a parallel platform of conflict transformation, the confrontational nature of existing platforms, such as, again, the Geneva International Discussions or incident prevention and reaction mechanism will also change and they will become more constructive. However, the success of the proposed dialogue will largely depend on the preparedness of the parties and also support from the outside. And uh, before closing, uh, I would like to outline the possible role of the United States here. The US government could act alone or better as part of a coalition of international actors, such as the EU, UN, uh, or OSCE. Uh, the support uh, to the dialogue from the US together with coalition partners should aim at the following. First, politically backing up the dialogue to prevent the protagonists of the dialogue, both in Georgia and Abkhazia, from becoming hostages of the local internal political fight. Second, hedging the anticipated uh, rapprochement against possible sabotage by Russia. The third, enhancing support to Georgia's civil society in order to promote the ideas of conflict transformation and then shape proper public opinion. And last but not least, um, allocation of resources for the implementation of the projects of assistance and or cooperation across the ABL as and if agreed within the framework of much anticipated direct dialogue format between Tbilisi and Suhumi. With this, I will stop here and will look forward to listening to other colleagues and then answer any questions that, may, that my remarks could have raised. Thank you. Thank you, Archil. Um, uh, definitely interesting and some of the maybe uh, points that require uh, in-depth discussion and maybe uh, some uh, critique as well, but that's why we are here to discuss uh, this type of uh, uh, idea. Sure. Our, our sure. next next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Jim Carafano, James Carafano. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Jim is a 25 years uh, uh, army veteran and uh, excellent writer. He directs several national security and defense programs at uh, Heritage Foundation, and uh, uh, he's obviously. Uh, one of the uh, great strategic thinkers that observes our region and our part of the world from a uh, global perspective. So, Jim, with this short introduction, please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. I I'll be relatively brief because I would love to hear uh, more of the conversation. This is such an important uh, conference, and I'm so deeply honored to be 
uh, part of it. And I've already actually learned a, a great deal. So kudos to really putting on a, a really important and, and impactful event. Um, so we're going to focus on the security angle. And what I just really want to home, hammer home is just the three key issues that the U.S. and Georgia just need to keep front and center. I think these are the critical and most important ones. And obviously the first is uh, the U.S. must continue to advocate for Georgia's membership in, in NATO. Uh, and, and I have a few more comments on, on that in just a second. But the second point, which I think is, is important, is the, the direction that we've taken the bilateral military relationship, I think it's, it's so positive and so constructive and focused on exactly the right things. And, and part A of that is really focusing on territorial defense and really um, credit to the Georgian military establishment for understanding the importance of, of focusing on this mission, developing the capabilities, and the U.S. being a constructive partner in that. And the second part of that is really creating the opportunities and capabilities and infrastructure for, a boast, uh, for boasting the U.S. presence uh, and NATO presence in the Black Sea. So, so crucial uh, to make Georgia even more valuable um, to the Western Alliance and to enhance conventional strategic deterrence, which is ultimately the, the goal here. And of course, the third is to continue to pressure Russia to end its illegal occupation of Georgian territory and abide by the 2008 six-point ceasefire agreement. So let me let me just um, follow that up with kind of two key points here. One is the importance of Georgian membership in NATO. Um, obviously, not just important for Georgia, not just important strategically to to an important flank of the transatlantic community. But I think the most critical strategic imperative that the alliance has to make clear for enhancing stability in Western Europe is to make sure that everybody understands, particularly Moscow, that Putin does not get a veto on who joins NATO. If, if Russia has a veto on who joins NATO, that I think is as great a threat the future stability uh, and importance of a political military alliance uh, as, as invading divisions. So keeping Georgia on the NATO membership track and U.S. continuing to just beat the drum on that is so vitally important. And I just want to emphasize one point quickly here, which is the U.S. and, and other NATO partners need to really press forward the, the, the option that there is a credible option for Georgia to join NATO now, and that is through a temporary modification of Article 6 of the NATO Charter. This was done when Greece and Turkey joined NATO in 1951. Uh, sometimes it's laughing, <laughs> I know, I find it humorous, that people talk about it as the coffee plan. Luke Coffey, who's our great analyst who works on this issue, has been one of the greatest proponents on that. And and indeed, he actually has a, a future paper coming out that goes into this more detail, but really emphasizing that even with Russian occupation, there is a path forward for NATO politically and militarily to enter, to enter NATO right now. And indeed, there's no country, aspirin country, that is more qualified and better prepared and ready to join NATO today than Georgia. And just a second comment here, uh, and I'll wrap up. And, and that is the, the, the great progress that's been made on U.S.-Georgian relationship over the last four years. And I think here, the, Georgia's been very, very smart. And this is what we see increasingly with strategic partners in the United States. What is very, very important um, is we, we come together for strategic reasons. But what, what builds the, the strong bonds and, and which really creates strategic value and a strong community is when we, when we expand beyond that. And so with Georgia, for example, the, the, the military reasons, the security reasons for U.S.-Georgia partnership are just so compelling. But uh, it's important that economic uh, governance issues, cultural issues, business and economic investment, that we, that we spend a lot of time in that area and, and that we start to bring people into that conversation who aren't just the US-Georgia experts, 
but the, the broad swath of civil society in Georgia and the United States investing in this relationship. I'll just hold India out as a good example. The US India strategic partnership is obviously going closer together. That, of course, was largely driven by joint concern on China. But, but what makes the Indian US partnership so dynamic is that they are rap we, both sides are rapidly expanding it beyond just talking about the security issues and talking about a, a full-blown strategic relationship. And so I think that that, that de deepening and widening of the U.S.-Georgia relationship is so important. Uh, a lot's been done, so much more can be done. I just wanna compliment the notion of the idea of creating synergies with the Three C's initiatives. You know, Heritage has long argued that Three C's is one of the strongest, most important strategic initiatives going on in Europe today. Super supportive of seeing the United States engaged in that. Very, very important that people have figured on that, that creating the space for private sector investment is really the way forward. And I do think where we can forge partnerships, particularly with the Western Balkans and, and uh, Georgia and, and uh, that part of Europe, that is a, 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 a great initiative and a great way to go. And so I'm really, really um, super complimentary and, and, and super supportive of creative ideas that are that are uh, working in that, that uh, direction. Um, and finally, what I'll say is, look, um, we have made all the right moves the last four years. And this is not a political comment, it's not meant to be a partisan comment, is the, we have taken the US-Georgia relationship at where it, in the direction it needs to go. Certainly that's in the best strategic interest of the United States in an era of great power competition. Uh, we all know we're entering into an election season here in the United States, regardless of the outcome of the election in November. The, the one thing that we should all push for, count on, uh, advocate for, and insist on is this partnership is going in the right direction. Now is not the tame, time to change, fiddle, or whatever. It's how do we accelerate? How do we add momentum? How do we create creative new thinking like Georgian possible participation in the three season initiatives? How do we move forward? It, it is not, it, it is time to build on what we have because what we've accomplished the last four years really has been incredibly admirable. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Great comments and uh, um, great to see optimism in, uh, uh, in, in your eyes and in your presentation. So I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there is a potential and multiple sort of facets of, of, of potential that we need to utilize. Now I would like to turn to uh, Mr. Victor Kipiani, who is a chair of the GeoCase uh, think tank. I've known Victor for uh, more than 20 years probably now. Uh, we met through America Georgia Business Council and his, uh, his uh, uh, advocacy uh, uh, activities on behalf of different businesses and different organizations. He has uh, more than two decades of practicing uh, law in, in, in Georgia and other countries. And uh, <clears throat> he's always on the right side when he, uh, when he uh, takes the case. So that's very important for a lawyer. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but he last couple of years, he's very proactive in uh, also, he entered the world of uh, think, tank, uh, think tanks in, uh, in Georgia. And now uh, some of his thinking and writing is actually penetrates uh, uh, other parts of the world as well, including the United States. So I welcome him and uh, uh, Victor, your thoughts. Thank you, Mamoka. Thank you for your nice introduction and thank you for inviting me to participate. Uh, well, obviously the end of the Cold War, the continued occupation and the pandemics uh, have created many extremely, as we say, new normals and brain thesis in regional international relations and securities. Many important questions uh, remain unanswered, and the historical unpredictability of our close neighborhood clearly show how the security of this nation is vulnerable. Once again, in a very short span of time, we are witnessing, if you will, a new wave of creative disruption, which brings to the fore the need for in-depth appraisal and some readjustments as well. Some of these uh, already existing threats or the threats which are re-emerging will definitely create new opportunities, not just new challenges. And in this very brief presentation, I would rather sum up those whose impact and priority seem to me, to me the most important. To start with, 
This country is on the front line of the conflict between two normative worlds, if you will, a matter conflict. One is of freedom and democracy, and another is that of oppression and revisionism. And when we ask ourselves what we need to bring up the resilience of Georgia, uh, the very first response which comes to my mind, and not just to my mind, but generally, is working out and putting into place an effective policies uh, capable of containing hybrid warfare. The latter is existential threat for Georgia, but it's, it's also a challenge for the United States and for the NATO. Also need to equip themselves with a modern system for, for rapid situ situational assessments and timely reactions to the hybrid tra threats. But uh, what concerns me, and it, it becomes a, understandably quite a big question, uh, when it comes uh, to the issue how to protect those uh, partner nations who are not formal members of the alliance, but in one way or another are linked, connected with the alliance. And that's indeed the issue. Beyond this large scale political, geopolitical uh, picture, Georgia is also on the front line of the friction between two regional hegemons Russia, the occupying power, and this growing Satanist, regional Satanist of Turkey. Besides uh, a new stage of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which to my view, very much resembles the proxy war. And definitely, you know, those uh, taken all together, they're worsening the region of Pugmire and requiring from us sort of, you know, new creative approaches. As if this was not enough, a further challenge is a shift of balance, as um, uh, uh, distinguished speakers have pointed out, is a shifting balance of power in the Black Sea region. Uh, Definitely, Georgia is not just a patch of land between Black Sea and Caspian Sea, but it's at the crossroads where the Eurasian policies of the West, Russia and China, come at loggerheads. We must also not lose a sight of the fact that Georgia's location is both the reason for its security concerns and the source for its economic growth. Same time, by itself, the Black Sea region is an arena for competition our influence, access, and information. And therefore, my appeal to this nation and to our partners that what we require at this point, not the strategic uh, patience, but strategic persistence. And that is very important. I believe that progressive US shift towards a more extended form of deterrence in the Black Sea region would be a sort of in a timely response to those who are still the hostages of the somewhat prevalent Senkaku paradox, or who mistakenly believe that the enemy of my friend is not necessarily my enemy. And that is very important to remember. I would also pay attention to the Secretary Pompeo's statement on the inadmissibility of a closed South China Sea. And that restriction should equally apply to the Black Sea and Black Sea region. Besides, I believe that opening in a very near future a NATO excellence center in Batumi would send a strong signal that Georgia ranks among vital interests of its strategic partners. The next source of concern is our proximity to the Middle East. The late say uh, will obviously continue a focus of United States uh, interests and policies, but the recent discussions about readjusting those policies could eventually take us to reconsidering the role of Georgia and probably identifying a new extra additional role, which is, if you will, a safety locker of Western interest in the Black Sea, Caspian region, and beyond. I believe this, is, this could be a good fundamentals, good premises to build on a qualitatively new stage of our relationship and our strategic partner. And I also believe that that signature outlook would be very much in line and consistent with US national security strategy and US national defense policy strategy. Those papers speak expressively about building up a deterrence in Europe and the Middle East. And I also trust the uh, conceptual, the new conceptual security paper that the Georgian National Security Council is working on would provide for adequate assessment of national and regional threats, as well as for some good solutions and forward looking statements. And the last concern, which from my perspective, which relates to the two frozen conflicts in Georgia, which are essentially are not ethnic conflicts, but are geopolitical conflicts. 
And the nature of that, ge ge that geopolitical nation is precisely because of the fact that this nation has made its foreign policy choice and because of the fact that the occupying power is opposing to this choice. So I'm getting close to, my, uh, the, the, to the end of my speech and hopefully I managed you know, to sketch out you know, some of the challenges, but opportunities as well. I believe that more than any of our neighbors, we strive to be democracy and safety, place of safety, not just for our own people, but for our allies. And I think you know, that consensus uh, is readily identifiable uh, both among the country's political elite and at the very uh, grassroots level. And finally, just sort of, you know, we're using a small plot of uh, history, uh, one of history's famous uh, speeches. This nation shed uh, blood, sweat, and tears for its monumental toil to maintain the freedom of choice. And that choice must be recognized at its true value. Georgia punches well above its weight, and the greatest pain would be not to suffer but suffering in vain. So thank you very much, Mamuka. Thank you, dear speakers. And I would, of course, be very much delighted to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Very uh, uh, interesting uh, points of view that require also some follow-up and discussion. Our next speaker, that we hopefully will have time to, for, to do that. Our next speaker is uh, our good friend, Mr. James O'Brien. Uh, Jim, are you there? Uh, Jim is a uh, vice president and uh, senior vice president and one of the founders of uh, Albright Stonebridge Group. Uh, uh, he is an experienced foreign policy uh, professional for almost three decades now and uh, also uh, very actively involved in several very interesting business projects uh, in different parts of the world, but mostly his focus is in Europe. And he's, he's been watching Georgia for the last at least 20 years, if more, not more than that. And he understands processes uh, in Georgia and also in bilateral uh, in, uh, relationships. So, Jim, after what you've heard today and uh, after your, all your many years of traveling to Georgia and understanding Georgia, what can you add to these uh, points of view that we've heard already? I, uh, thanks, Mamuka. I, I don't know that I can add anything, but I can maybe invite everybody to think through a few themes that um, are going to take the best efforts of both Georgia and the U.S. to, to find our way forward. Um, I really appreciate being invited to, to be here today. It's obviously uh, an anniversary uh, that's very important, I think, for both our countries and in um, uh, changing the way we view the possibilities with with, with Russia for the US and obviously for Georgia to can face the continued violation of your territory and the threats to your people. Um, and also to be in part as part of this uh, institution's event. Um, these are the kinds of conversations that the US and Georgia can have, but it's because of the commitment of individuals like the ambassador, and his family, this institution, that we're able to have them and to build on um, ideas as time goes by. Um, I just, uh, I don't speak for any institution or a campaign or anybody um, here, but I, I, I do want to close my introduction just by, by uh, praising the quality of contributions. You know, every clever idea or specific initiative I thought I might suggest has been raised by one of the uh, earlier speakers. And I just think that's a, a uh, that's testimony to the quality of people that Mamuk has brought together. As he mentioned, I work with uh, organizations, especially companies and foundations around the world. And when uh, a region asks me, you know, how can we get more attention in Washington? How can we get a, a high quality conversation about what we need? I, I always say, you know, you, you need a Mamuka because he's able to find the right people and bring them together and have an agenda that builds over time. And I think that today's program uh, testifies to, to how well you, you do this, Mamuka. So what I want to do is rather than suggest answers, I want to note a few global uh, themes that I think are directly relevant to the U.S.-Georgia relationship and invite everybody to think along with them. And I, I believe there's some ideas already proposed in the the discussion so far that touch on these. Uh, so one of them is, what do we do with Russia? Now, it's interesting that in January 2021, 
uh, when a new presidential term begins here. It's probably the first time in decades that the new administration won't come in believing, you know, announcing that its foreign policy will comprise some new relationship with Russia. You know, we, we've seen par both parties emerge saying we'll be slightly tougher and we'll have a better relationship and or we're going to have a reset or we're going to work with a new Russia. And I don't think there's anything but fatigue and, and lowered expectations about what it will be possible with Russia going forward. Um, as, as Steve Began said, we all American policymakers reject the notion that there'll be a severe of influence by any country. And so I think you'll see continued support for all of the great work Georgia has done to build its individual, you know, its, its, its own way forward. But it's a slightly different context, right? I think the fear that some in Georgia may have had when prior administrations, especially a new administration began, that uh, there'd be some grand deal with Russia that would somehow uh, move Georgia away from the center of U.S. considerations for the Caucasus of the region. I think here the question's a little different, right? It's, it's what do we do with a Russia that sees it doesn't have much to gain or all that much to lose by the way it treats its neighbors because the, the, there's little prospect of, uh, of Russia being accepted again as a legitimate sort of, uh, you know, state building the international structure. So, so that's a, an area where obviously Georgia knows this better than most of us. And I, I think it's a topic we all ought to consider as we, we go forward. Second question for me is about the role of the, the rule of law as we, we look forward. I think um, one thing that's really struck home in the US over the last four or five years is the way that corruption and um, the self-enrichment of political leaders corrupts international cooperation. People simply are not, countries are not good partners if their political systems are rooted upon nepotism and self-dealing. And, and so we're looking at how one approaches that. And I think you'll see the possibility of, of stronger um, international requirements around um, the, the rule of law, whether it involves money laundering or domestic judicial systems and their independence and quality, the need to have proper civil society checks on power. All of these topics are, are emerging as real themes in policymaking of, uh, of what we used to be called the West. Um, and again, as Steve Began emphasized, it's very important for Georgia to continue its work in this area, especially the need for an independent judiciary um, and it's able to uphold the rule of law and, and for avoiding the kind of informal power structures that can often um, erode the, the kinds of institutions that are needed to, to have effective rule of law. Now, this is a tough one though, because, and this is what we have to think about. It's unclear to me what this means, this commitment to rule of law means for the international system or this acknowledgement that mere membership in an international entity doesn't, in, doesn't bring along with it automatic adherence to the rule of law. So we see EU member states backsliding. We see states on the border of the EU backsliding and sort of the rise of this, uh, you know, illiberal democracy or authoritarian tendencies wrapped in some electoral cloak. And, and I'm not sure how that's going to be approached or that there will be any single approach in, uh, by, by the U.S. Uh, in any place going forward. I think there'll be some tendency to retreat to a sort of core realist approach to the world, that we work with states as they are and we try to achieve our interests in cooperation with them. That probably will be the dominant trend in some places. Um, I, I, I think though there will also be an emphasis on um, having stronger commitments to shared values and to the rule of law, um, possibly in slightly smaller groupings or in groupings that are, are reaffirmed to, uh, to be based upon shared values in the way that NATO is. And I think NATO has upheld this as a vision, um, even as other international groupings have failed. So there's talk of new international groupings or of uh, new requirements and existing ones. And, and I think here, this is a, a place for Georgia to, to consider how it will play some role as this, the international landscape reshapes around those issues. But it will be possible only if Georgia retains its commitment and, and reinforces its tendencies to work toward independent judiciary and a, a truly independent and vibrant civil society. 
The, the third broad trend that's of interest to me is really the role of China. Um, and there have been many references to it here um, today. But one of the things we, we do see is that in international financial circles, both private sector and in the IMF World Bank world, there's a, there's a recognition that real economic development comes from being part of broad supply chains, being part of the, the, the most profitable um, uh, economies in the world. And so Georgia, as a small economy, needs to figure out where it fits into these broader, these broader trends. For the last 25 years, we've seen that its global supply chains have been where much of the growth has been. The pandemic and political tensions alongside it are, I think, bringing a, a time for reconsideration of that. Um, there's a recognition that uh, Europe in particular, say, needs a resilient supply chain, that it can't count on bringing basic materials in from China, or, or uh, whether it's raw commodities or, or you know, manufactured goods. They can't always make it around the globe in a timely fashion. And that's going to mean a change in the, the way the countries participate in the supply chain. There'll be less tolerance, I think, for the kind of opaque financing, again, Steve Began referred to that, that, that we, we have seen from, from China, but, but also maybe a little less opportunity in signing up for the kind of one-way flow of goods. What does that mean for a country like Georgia? Well, and, and here uh, I've been involved in the developments around the pot of, uh, port of uh, Poti. And, and I think it sets a couple of markers that are important for Georgia to consider. One of them is a diversity of trading partners. What I've liked is to see the way in which that port brings in goods, not just from a couple of major players, but, but from all of the states of the region um, coming out to, to reach the global um, marketplace. The other one is a two-way trade. I mean, one of the exciting days of Poti was actually, I think about six years ago now, when we, we brought for the first time the possibility of grain exports moving from Central Asia out rather than simply in as, as this whole exercise began 25 years ago. And so being a part of a, a, a trading pattern that's resilient and has multiple avenues is I think critical for Georgia going forward. And, and which project fits into that is you know, a matter for Georgia to decide. But I just think as the landscape changes, we're no longer looking for how things move in, in just one direction, but it becomes a, a much more interesting um, a, a set of choices um, in front of, of Georgia. And I think the foreign minister referred to many of these, these trends as well in his remarks. So those are the three sort of things that I think are different, right? I'm pointing to, I think Jim Carafano was absolutely right. What we need to do is build on what we have been doing, but we have to do that in a new context. And I think both changing attitudes toward Russia toward the rule of law and toward China, are changing the context in which what we have been doing will still have the chance to succeed, but we need to be aware of how to do it differently. I'm not sure exactly what that will mean. I think it's gonna be an ongoing conversation um, that, that we have to keep having in settings like this one. So with that, Mamaka, I'll turn it back over to you and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Jim. Uh, some, again, excellent points. And again, um, uh, it's great to have uh, uh, this multiple uh, points of view, and uh, they all come together in uh, in uh, in a necessity to deepen uh, uh, this collaboration and build on existing um, ties, but also some new ideas there that are very interesting. Our next speaker is uh, the Ambassador Van Doren, uh, Doctor Van Doren from uh, uh, he's from Belgium, but uh, he. Uh, He's probably one of the most interesting uh, people at uh, this discussion today. Uh, somebody who witnessed actually uh, conversations in Moscow exactly 12 years ago uh, between uh, the Russian leaders and uh, President Sarkozy when he was uh, negotiating a ceasefire agreement. Ambassador Dorn was at that time acting uh, uh, ambassador from EU to Russia. Uh, but uh, besides that, he uh, worked uh, in uh, Croatia as an ambassador at the time when Croatia joined the European Union. So his expertise and knowledge is definitely very, very helpful to Georgia. Uh, he, uh, he has a law degree and he's a doctor of, uh, of law. 
and uh, uh, he also worked in uh, different institutions focusing on trade. So uh, his experience is definitely very valuable for by, by all means to Georgia and his experience uh, ap applied to Georgia is uh, something that we uh, greatly uh, need. Uh, Ambassador, can you turn please uh, camera and uh, mic on? Does that work? Yeah, we have a little contrajour. We don't see you well, but... Uh... Uh -huh. Maybe I should uh, uh, take another seat. Just a second. I'm sorry for that. That's okay. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> And meanwhile, I would like to ask uh, uh, maybe Geshidze to prepare one uh, question, answers to questions. He mentioned transformation of uh, conflict rather than resolution of conflict. Maybe he will explain a little bit in very short terms uh, what does he mean and if there are any examples of that uh, to, to tell us about that. Ambassador, it looks like you are ready. I am. Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me to this excellent event. Um, I feel a little bit like an intruder because this brainstorming session seems to be primarily a Georgian United States of America event, but I have no problem with that. Um, no, actually we needed European perspective, that's why you are here. <laughs> and thank you very much for giving me uh, that opportunity. Uh, I know how important uh, the European Union is uh, for Georgia, like uh, NATO is of key importance to Georgia, as has been said a few times here. Um, and you rightly refer to the fact that I witnessed developments when I was based in Moscow uh, exactly 12 years ago, and it is a privilege uh, that you give me the opportunity today to contribute to this uh, important uh, anniversary um, and I hope that I can uh, bring you some useful thoughts for EU-Georgia cooperation. I must say that when I was preparing for this event and only a few days ago I um, by coincidence came across a speech uh, which I read in writing uh, which was written uh, but the author was um, David Zakaliani, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Georgia. And I was struck by one particular sentence in that statement. And it, I quote, Georgia has never been closer to the EU. This, in my view, is a very significant statement, but it also reflects, in my mind, uh, an important factual and true situation. And this, after 12 years of the events to which we referred, is quite an achievement. Now, you may be familiar with some of the elements I would like to um, highlight, but I wanted to build on what the, the minister uh, had uh, written and also on what he said earlier on, actually, and he did very eloquently. Uh, there are indeed a number of convincing facts which fully demonstrates the current closeness of Georgia to the EU. First of all, as you all know, in June 2014, the EU and Georgia signed the Association Agreement, which already entered into force in 2016. This agreement strives for political association and economic integration between the EU and Georgia. Very important objectives. Secondly, Short while later, the EU and Georgia entered into a deep and comprehensive free trade area, which Georgia is still in the process of implementing. But this offers Georgia a dramatic increase of market access to the EU, an increased freedom of establishment, lower market access barriers, modernized procurement practices, and so on and so forth. Three, Georgian citizens have been able to benefit from vis-a-free visa visa travel to the Schengen area since March 2017. 
more than half a million of Georgians have already traveled to the EU without a visa. Four, the EU is Georgia's largest trading partner. About 27% of Georgia's trade, external trade, is with the EU, followed by its trade with, with Turkey, only half, 13.6% on the basis of the latest figures I could get hold of, and only 11% with Russia. I think this is very significant. And of course, the bilateral trade between the EU and Georgia continues to increase. On the financial side, I'm happy to report that Georgia benefits from more than 100 million euros, technical and financial assistance on a yearly basis under the European Neighborhood Instrument in order to achieve the goals set out in the association agreement. And what is also important to know is that more than half of this financing is in the form of non-reimbursable grants and the rest in, is in the form of loans. Next point I would like to highlight, Georgia is implementing this association agenda, uh, which actually sets out the roadmap for the association agreement and the priorities for the period 2017-2020 are the following. And some have been also mentioned by some other speakers, because that's also of importance to uh, US interests. After all, in terms of enlargement or in cooperation with countries in the region, US interests, in interests and US interests are not all that different in my view. So concentration on the reform of public administration, the reform of the justice system, and also the reform of the agriculture and rural sectors. Let me also point what the minister also very well highlighted that Georgia has been fighting this COVID-19 pandemic so well. And because of that, the EU uh, very quickly granted an assistance package of more than 250 million in grants and 150 million euros in loans. Lots of money in a short period of time. Georgia is also benefiting from other financing programs, regional programs such as Erasmus Plus, Horizon 2020, Creative Europe. And as you know, and reference has been made to the East the European Union Eastern Partnership Policy, Georgia has been part for that for a long period of time. In June this year, the leaders of the European member states and the European institutions, together with the leaders of the countries, part of the Eastern Partnership, met virtually because of the pandemic and let the basis, lay down the basis for the future policy of the EU towards the partnership, Eastern Partnership countries up to 2030. Now, in June, no major progress has been made on substance, but this will remains to be worked out between now and spring 2021. But the goals have already been identified. Security, increasing stability, prosperity and resilience. Two, environment, such as the Paris Agreement on climate change and the UN 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development Goals. And three, financing of the reforms to be implemented under this deep and comprehensive free trade area. And the last point I would like to say, it's maybe not spectacular, but I find it very interesting and it proves the high profile Georgia has taken in its relationship with the European Union. Two years ago, the European Union and Georgia opened in Tbilisi a European school. The first ever European school, the EU, launched outside its borders. The aim of this school is to integrate students from the Eastern Partnership countries into the European education by aligning the curricula with the European standards. This, in my view, demonstrates strongly the commitment of Georgia to the European idea. This school aims at recruiting teachers and pupils from the entire region, giving high profile, as I said, to the role of Georgia. I would now very briefly, because I think I'm probably uh, reaching my time limit. This raises the question, how can Georgia 
make further progress on the path to the EU. And I wanted to highlight this because of my experience when I was supporting Croatia in making progress towards EU membership. My answers are the following. One, Georgia should, should scrupulously implementing the reforms provided in the association agreement, as well as in the deep and comprehensive free trade area. Two, Georgia should, should closely cooperate with the European Union for identifying the priorities under the Eastern Partnership beyond 2020, to which I just alluded. This is the time to do this, together with the European Union, the Member States and the Commission. And three, by supporting the key policy objectives of the European Union, such as its digital agenda, the Green Deal and the EU's interconnectivity strategy. And of course, in light of recent positive developments in uh, Georgia, it's important for Georgia to strictly implement the new electoral reform. And I would last but not least also add that Georgia must make sure that it fully implements and rightly implements the visa-free regime and avoids any misuse that could hamper its success. I'll pause here. Thank you, Paul. Uh, great remarks and some interesting also factual uh, details that we all, I think, uh, need to hear from time to time to refresh our knowledge and, uh, and uh, understanding of commitment, bilateral commitment between, between EU and, uh, and, uh, and Georgia. Uh, in order to save time, so I'll move forward with the uh, Archil question that I asked Archil Gagishidze, please, if you could, uh, uh, and then we'll move forward to some of other other questions. Archil, please. Okay, um, thank you, Mamuka, for, for this question. It's a really very important question, although the concept of conflict transformation is not new. In our uh, realities, this is something uh, which uh, needs to be paid uh, very serious attention. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll try to make a point that we need uh, certain adjustments in our uh, policies uh, and attitudes towards uh, the conflicts in, in Georgia. Uh, why? Because the, uh, the, name in, uh, the, the name of the game in town these days is the conflict resolution. Everything, uh, everything, both uh, discussions, debates, or peace initiatives, everything is done in the name of the conflict resolution. But the conflict resolution rests on the on a zero-sum paradigm, acting under the paradigm of the uh, under this paradigm, the com uh, confronting sides vigorously defend uh, their respective red lines uh, at every possible platform, such as even I mean, such as Geneva or scientific conferences or in the mainstream media, because these red lines involve practically irreconcilable positions. Every attempt of dialogue. Uh, or negotiation in any of the formats is doomed to failure and further alienates the parties to the conflict. For example, the most important red line for the Georgian side are, for example, restoration of territorial integrity and the occupation of Abkhaz and South Ossetia. While for the Abkhaz and South Ossetians, uh, the, the, the most important red line is the state independence from Georgia. One of the derivatives of these red lines is the policy of non-recognition actively pursued by the government of Georgia and supported by the majority of the international community. Of course, these red lines will not disappear in the foreseeable future. They will, not, they will always remain the subject of public consensus in respective societies and the top priority of the official policies of the authorities in Tbilisi, in Sukhumi and Srinvali. In contrast, the conflict transformation paradigm suggests a win-win approach. When moving towards transformation, the parties acknowledge each other's red lines, agree to disagree on them, but still make a step forward in terms of agreeing on politically non-sensitive issues. Conflict transformation denotes actions directed at transforming a destructive conflict into a constructive conflict. The transformation of the conflict does not involve the harmonization of the red lines, that is, the resolution of the conflict. It may even not necessarily be an intermediate stage towards resolution, but in any case, it is a step forward. Several cases serve as an inspiration. The first case concerns the nature of relations between the Georgians and South Ossetian sides in late 90s and uh, in the late 1990s and uh, uh, to early 2000s, when at the population level, 
the reconciliation was already a fact. Unfortunately, the events of the 2004 and 2008 destroyed uh, the situation. Now we have to rebuild these relationships. The other cases are the conflicts in Cyprus or uh, in Moldova and Transnistria, where inter-ethnic hostility has been overcome and the population on both sides of the conflict divide communicate freely, trade freely, undertake mutually beneficial business projects. In all these cases, conflicts still have to be settled politically. However, as a result of deep transformation of the situation of violence and fear, the tolerant attitude and mutually beneficial relationships uh, contribute to the creation of an atmosphere of peace, reconciliation and social justice. And regrettably in this respect, the situation around conflicts in Georgia, unfortunately, lags far behind. Thank you, Thank Achil. You. I think this definitely requires further sort of discussion and in-depth sort of analysis and uh, pros and cons of, of, of this approach. But I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely an idea that has a, a right to live and, and, uh, and uh, exercised and uh, discussed. Uh, Jim, uh, I would like to now turn to you and uh, you mentioned again important point about uh, uh, about NATO and uh, and uh, membership and prospects and so forth. Other than that, I mean, this is a definitely will remain as a hot and top issue in, in in discussions. Other than that, sort of what other maybe uh, priority you would see? Uh, I mean. Clearly, the, uh, the uh, collective security is the, uh, and the NATO umbrella is the most obvious uh, security umbrella that Georgia may have. But next to that, what, what do you see as a, or maybe parallel to that, what do you see as an alternative uh, uh, kind of immediate uh, uh, steps that can ensure better security of Georgia under the current circumstances? So you have two gems. So I'm assuming you mean Jim. Yeah, Jim Garafano, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I would, I, again, I would go back to the, uh, the Three Seas Initiative. And um, because I think the Three Seas Initiative is not just an economic project, uh, because you're building out physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure, uh, energy security, and you're building a north-south integration of uh, of line of economic activity and commerce and the supply chain across the, the frontier of, of Europe. Um, it also has a security dimension to it. So I do think that partnerships that build on the Three Seas Initiative have strategic value in addition to great economic potential. Um, I thought Jim made some really interesting comments on that. And one area in terms of going forward I think is very important is the Blue Dot Network that I think folks are familiar with. I think this is the Blue Dot Network creates a set of standards uh, for, for sound infrastructure projects. Uh, it creates an incentive and an environment for, for um, private sector investment and for building trust and confidence and good governance and partners. So I, I, think, I think there's something there. Blue Dot Network, three season initiative. I, I think that's gonna be a focus. And the other one I'll just mention obviously is um, increasingly the concern among NATO about the, the Black Sea and, and really building out that, that security architecture. So anything that the US and, and uh, Georgia can do on a bilateral basis, uh, obviously anything where, where we're working more closely with, with Romania, with, with like-minded partners in the region and, and building it out, uh, supplementing where we can, kind of NATO initiatives, because NATO is going to move at its pace, but I think there are things that can be done on the bilateral and multilateral level that could create a, a stronger stronger posture for NATO partnership. So those are those are areas I would look at. And again, I would go back to the territorial defense issue, which I think is, is very important for um, solidifying uh, Georgia's future membership in, in, in NATO. So that would be my short list. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Victor, uh, I would like to uh, mention before I turn to question uh, that uh, Geocase uh, recently did a very interesting study about uh, soft power of Georgia in uh, North Caucasus. I don't know if it's translated already in, in English or not, but I think it's, it's under translation right now. But I think among other uh, research papers that Geocase did recently, this 
this is something that uh, relatively less explored area in Georgia. That's why I wanted to mention to the audience that this is coming uh, hopefully soon in English language as well, and we'll be able to distribute it. Uh, but this is something that, uh, uh, by the way, was very dear to the heart of Levan Mikheladze, uh, studying neighborhood, in particular looking at North Caucasus, was something that he was very interested in. Uh, now, my question is more about like internal consensus. We talk about a lot about bilateral relationship between Georgia and United States. We talk about European aspect of uh, integration of Georgia and Europe. So uh, being in Georgia and being part of the Georgian society, what's your feeling about, you know, is it the national consensus in, in Georgia? Is it something that still has a strong opposition or some opposition? So very briefly, if you could, this guy, I know that's a long kind of question for the long answer, but maybe you could, you could tell us in a couple of minutes what, what, what your perspective on this is. Manuka, thank you for your question and thank you for this opportunity to re-emphasize and uh, re-underline uh, the choice which we already have made, not just at the level of the Georgian uh, legislation. And we know uh, well enough that uh, the Georgian constitution is a very unique exception because it speaks so explicitly about the country's foreign policy choice. But apart from that, when you when, when I speak about the, uh, the broader consensus, you know, let me rephrase myself, okay, at the level of the constitution, you can speak about the foreign policy choice. But at the level of society, at the level, at the, at the civil level, you can speak about civilizational choice, if you wish. Because that is, that is from my standpoint, that is much broader concept. It's more, uh, it's more of existential concept. And I should remind to our dear audience that we've been always the part of that, uh, the, the, the family, civilizational family, unless, if not that, those uh, misfortunes of being the, sort of, you know, the prisoner of geography and being put under the various strains of the historical turmoils. So, you know, uh, again, you know, getting back to the euro, Getting back to the uh, Euro-Atlantic Euro uh, the, the community, it's not just about signing treaties. It's not just about legalese or having instruments into the place. It's about your existential choice. It's about your development. Without uh, all exaggerating, you know, it's about survival, if you will. So I think that um, I think that although, of course, you know, Russian soft power, not just sort of sharp power, you know, plays its role in the Georgian politics, and we should admit and we should acknowledge. Uh, that's why I spoke about the hybrid war and hybrid uh, threats. But I think that the the I mean, when I ended my my presentation, saying that it's a broad consensus, and that consensus because, frankly speaking, if you take Georgian mainstream political parties. You should be a political suicide, just, you know, forgetting about, you know, civilization, not to declare, not to pursue that very strong choice. So I think that, I think, you know, that uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the bats are made and uh, we are sort of, you know, walking our uh, half of the road and expecting that the remaining half of that road would be walked equally, steadily, and resiliently by our partners. So that, that, that is our expectation. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim uh, O'Brien, uh, very briefly, if, uh, if you look at the sort of neighborhood of Georgia, and uh, uh, there are some different dynamics on the south side, and I know that you traveled to Turkey uh, frequently in the past, and you understand that country, and if, if you can say a few words about in one minute, you know, where you see sort of this evolution of, of uh, sort of Tur Turkish realities uh, uh, go and uh, what type of impact you think it may, is, what is happening there? Is it, is it uh, uh, strategically it's an important partner for Georgia and for many countries, including the United States. So are you concerned about uh, developments in Turkey or are you optimistic of, of, and if you don't want to answer to that question, you are free to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll, you'll force me to start an answer where I don't know where I'm going to end up and that's incredibly dangerous. Um, yeah, I'm very concerned about developments in Turkey. I think um, you, you have a government that's desperate to still be in place in 2023 on the centenary of, of its um, 
the, the modern Turkish state's founding, and it will do anything to stay there. Um, along the way, it's lost a lot of the talent that drove reforms that made the first few years of this government, I think, a very successful government. Um, and I think that is uh, um, a point of real concern for any country that relies on Turkey as a partner. Having said that, it needs, Turkey will have to find its new way of managing um, with its, its, um, its neighbors, uh, particularly around the prospect of oil and gas fields in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, they're in this kind of chest thumping mode right now, but the positions aren't sustainable. Um, you know, they, they've essentially created a situation where nobody can benefit from the greatest economic asset that's been found in the region for a long time. Um, so I do think we'll see changes in that. I think back to the theme of my remarks, this is an opportunity for Georgia to distinguish itself as the people on this call have been working to do for a long time. That this is a Georgia that's always looking to uh, reform and reshape itself to be a bold voice for uh, greater integration of the neighborhood and having that voice is incredibly important for the people who will be trying to shape a new relationship with states like Turkey, um, because it, it, you know it, th that new relationship can't be based upon a demand from Washington or Brussels, right? It has to come in a way to reflect the realities of the region. So having Georgia's voice is a really important component in what the relationship ultimately will be with Turkey. Great answer, Jim. Uh, that emphasizes one more time the uh, the proactive necessity for proactive policies of Georgia in of not just in domestic issues but also foreign policy. Uh, Ambassador Van Doren, uh, I have very uh, kind of uh, limited time left, and the one question for you: We talked a lot about several people mentioned three C initiatives, mm. and uh, it started, I think, from Croatia a few years ago, right? So that's correct. Uh, yeah, so maybe uh, do you see any prospects of integration of 3C initiative or integration of maybe Eastern Partnership countries or selected countries from Eastern Partnership into that initiative? I think personally that the 3C in initiative, which is informal by nature, but which by now has developed quite an ambitious work program and has been very actively involved in setting up a number of uh, projects. Uh, and primarily amongst 12 EU member states, but of course from the start the United States was very interested. And I would say by definition because of the activities which are being deployed by the Three Seas Initiative, Georgia should be interested. I know that in the context of the Viking train, which is a railway project for um, freight, uh, which links um, the Estonia to the through the east part, well, the Baltics to the to the uh, to the Baltic Sea and even to the Caucasus. I know that there, um, George is already acting as a joint operator. So there is an angle, and I would like to encourage Georgia to take advantage of the upcoming uh, Free Seas Summit and Business Forum, which will take place in October in Tallinn, and the prime objectives. The major themes for discussion are the digital agenda and also the free movement of data, but of course there will be many other uh, items being discussed and it will be a very high um, representation also uh, by the Commission. So there is ample opportunity for Georgia to make its ideas known. And I would also link this to what I already said, that there is an opportunity during the next six to nine months also for Georgia to be proactive in talking uh, to the EU delegation in Tbilisi, but the Georgian ambassador in uh, Brussels to the EU institutions and at various levels, obviously, about scoping and defending the interests of Georgia in the context of this partnership uh, policy towards 2030. Uh, Georgia is well heard in Brussels. So Georgia is well placed to make its views known. There is no problem that Georgia identifies and defends its interests. That's normal business. We have no problem with that and the EU institutions have no problem with that, but it can do so in a proper dialogue. 
Many thanks, many thanks, Ambassador. And um, now I'd like to thank all the members of this panel, participants, uh, for their uh, great and valuable contribution. Unfortunately, we have this format doesn't allow us to uh, extract all the knowledge from you guys, but uh, we'll have discussions going forward. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your uh, participation. And I apologize to our uh, uh, speakers, uh, uh, next uh, two speakers, the ambassadors, your excellencies. Uh, uh, we apologize for delay in the program, but uh, uh, if uh, Ambassador Degnan is online, yes. So I would like to uh, ask you to maybe uh, give us a few comments about what we heard today, uh, but also uh, maybe in few words where you see prospects of bilateral Georgian US relationships. Uh, going forward. You've been in Georgia about six months now, I think, a little more than six months, seven months probably, and uh, you already know Georgia. Uh, obviously, um, uh, you had great, you have great experience of working in other countries of the world, and uh, uh, you have now, you've been there enough to compare what Georgia looks like and how it compares uh, with other countries, and uh, so the floor is yours. Sorry for delay. Well, thank you very much for First, for organizing this very interesting uh, conference and very informative for me. I haven't been here long enough to, um, to have the depth of, of knowledge that the speakers you've called together here have, and I really appreciate being included in this. Um, a very important topic at a, at a particularly important time, I think, both for Georgia and for our relations with Georgia. Um, as the Deputy Secretary Began said, um, this a, a vibrant democracy in Georgia, a commitment to a closer integration with the West, are critical elements of the U.S.-Georgia relationship. We have a shared vision for this region of being um, stable, free of conflict, prosperous, um, and with Georgia continuing to develop its um, it's democratic governance. And I know from working with my EU colleague here that that's uh, very much a vision shared by the EU as well. Uh, I, I, I agree with um, Victor Kikiani's point that uh, Georgia's location is a source of economic growth and opportunity as well as instability and insecurity. It's uh, very true and it's, it presents opportunities and it, I think it ties in well with Mr. Carapano's point that um, our strategic partnership will be even more effective if, if it's broadened to include um, the cultural, economic, business issues that we here are working so hard to generate um, and to uh, energize um, for economic growth. Ethic someone mentioned, I 100% I agree that for this economic growth and more uh, foreign direct investment to come, Georgia truly needs an independent judiciary that guarantees a level playing field, um, as I think Deputy Secretary Began said as well. And this is, uh, the more I'm here, the longer I'm here, the more I realize that this is just a fundamental point for Georgia to realize its potential as a regional hub certainly as a regional transit hub, because investors need to have that confidence and that security that they're going to be able to um, have contracts enforced in a timely and a fair manner. Um, I would also uh, agree with Ambassador, Ambassador Gagashidze that it's important to see progress in the occupied territories through initiatives that bring people together there may be the Geneva International discussions, they're, they're, there's that process that's going on at that level, but uh, I, I agree 100% that time is not on Georgia's side in this case. There's a risk of losing a whole generation, both in Ankasia and Skimbali and also in Georgia, that don't have those kinds of contexts that, um, that hold families together and that hold memories across that ABL. Um, so finding perhaps the status neutral platform that the ambassador mentioned for dialogue, building on step for a better future or something like that. Um, these are initiatives that I think Georgia needs to start exploring um, with more focus uh, with uh, perhaps there are new opportunities in Alcazia at the very least. Um, uh, it has only been 20 years 
but Georgia has accomplished a lot. And I think the fact that it's viewed as a leader in the region is very much um, to its credit and a sign of the, the kind of commitment that Georgia has. Um, but as Dr. Van Doren said, now Georgia needs to commit to implementing and to following through to make its democratic institution strong and resilient. Um, it needs, to, what I have seen is it needs to take more ownership of its programs. It's at that level now where uh, Georgia needs to be driving these, uh, the, the commitment to its democratic growth and its economic growth. Um, I think uh, Jim O'Brien uh, uh, mentioned the importance of the commitment to rule of law and to re reinforcing that commitment to rule of law. Uh, again, to fighting corruption, to ensuring that there's not backsliding or um, taking for granted some of the accomplishments that Georgia has fought so hard to achieve. Um, ensuring a more robust civil society and an uncensored media, which are the, going to be those checks and balances uh, to, to help the uh, democratic institutions really take root here and be as strong and resilient as they need to be in any healthy democracy. Um, uh, and again, a truly independent judiciary and a parliament that represents the broad variety of voices and interests here are, are absolutely critical. Um, and I think Georgia has done taken some important steps in the last few months to try and lay the groundwork for that. Um, and what we'll see now is whether Georgia has continues to have the political will uh, to do the hard work of building its democratic institutions. If it does, it will certainly remain the leader in the region and an inspiring success story far beyond the region. Um, I, I think Mr. Carfano mentioned the elections both here and in the United States, uh, whatever the results of the elections in, um, in our countries, uh, what is not going to change is the U.S. commitment, and I would venture to say the EU commitment to Georgia's democratic development and to its successful Euro-Atlantic integration. As long as the, that is what Georgians want and Georgians are committed to doing, then I feel certain that the U.S. and I would say the EU partners um, will do all we can to help Georgia succeed. So I will leave it at that. Thank you again for, for letting me join this uh, very, very interesting and informative discussion. Thank you, Ambassador Degna. Thank you very much. Ambassador Bakradze, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I want to thank you. Uh, Mamuka, thank the U.S. Georgia Business Council and uh, Levan Mikhail, the foundation for this very timely event and, and congratulate with the very fruitful discussion. Uh, first, let me say how uh, blessed I feel personally that I have known uh, Levan, an extraordinary person and, and his lovely family. And I couldn't imagine a bigger honor uh, for a diplomat to continue the extensive work that, that Ambassador Mikhailadze uh, initiated uh, in, in Washington. And uh, I'm really humbled to join the high level speakers that have spoken today. And I'm sending my warmest greetings to my dear colleague, Ambassador Degnan and want to congratulate with an excellent job uh, in Tbilisi. And uh, let us summarize what has been said today and, and also let me do it from the perspective of a, a Georgian working uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, the biggest challenge that Georgia and the region has today is uh, territorial integrity issues. Uh, historically, uh, Georgia has managed to survive uh, numerous invasions, emerging more resilient and therefore we are quite optimistic about our future. We see regional cooperation as well as US-EU engagement as the possibility to find peaceful solution to the conflicts in the region. Another aspect is continuous effort from Georgia or other countries in the region uh, towards integration to the European Union and NATO. I think that at some point, Russia will realize that far from intimidating Georgia, they also have united the nations once again and our desire to join and, and accelerate our pace to the uh, marching to the NATO and European Union. And this is relevant for other countries of the region as well, where Russia unfortunately maintains its aggressive policies. Economic prosperity uh, for the countries of the region is another 
big priority and bilateral and trilateral partnerships in the region are a good example of uh, multinational projects that can only benefit the success of the best values in the region. We will do our share to build a mutually beneficial partnership that enhance the security and prosperity of our neighborhood. Uh, US has always been the strongest advocate for the democratic development of the countries, investing US taxpayers' money in it. And uh, we could say that proudly, uh, Georgia is a good example of that money wisely spent, illustrating the transformative effect of uh, that assistance. Uh, what should be done? Multilaterally, US stands really strong in uh, UN, in the NATO, in promoting peace and security through more engagement, more training, more presence. Even more should be the case for the Black Sea, as uh, we all understand there is no uh, European or transatlantic security without security on the Black Sea. Uh, we believe that U.S. should incentivize that through strongly promoting enlargement processes. Uh, probably that is the most successful policy uh, of uh, NATO or the EU that has brought peace and uh, security uh, for uh, hundreds of millions of uh, Europeans and uh, Georgians deserve uh, nothing less. On the economic dimension, uh, we see Europe-Asia connectivity as a multi-angle dimension that will benefit the countries of the region, but also help advance uh, in connecting largest economies of uh, uh, Europe and Asia in energy, in digital, in, in logistics, in human capital as well as create uh, new supply chains that the pandemic has demonstrated the West so eagerly needs. Uh, this we believe will unite EU, US, Japan and others in complementing efforts to achieve the common goals. Uh, bilaterally, of course, Georgia and the United States uh, benefit from the strategic partnership char charter, as well as Georgia defense readiness program and other programs on democracy, on economic development that advance uh, the country's resilience, uh, but also put our partnership at the higher level. And uh, there also is a big role of Congress to be mentioned. A good example of that is Georgia Support Act that was unanimously supported by the House of Representatives last year, which included strong support to Georgia's territorial integrity, boldly putting sanctions on those individuals who have gravely violated human rights in the occupied regions, but also calls for the start of negotiations with Georgia on the free trade agreement. That is yet another, yet another very well-deserved uh, and mutually beneficial, uh, tangible result to be of our partnership. And uh, we are hopeful that the Senate will push forward this legislation and adopt it uh, by the end of uh, this year. Uh, to summarize, I want to express hope that existing strategic partnership between Georgia and the United States will transform into a strong and durable alliance that will serve our common interests regionally as well as worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bakradze. And uh, <clears throat> very short kind of conclusion, concluding remarks. I think uh, we've asked many questions. We've heard some interesting uh, uh, positions and remarks, uh, elements of uh, strategy for uh, Georgia to think about, for bilateral relationships and people who are involved to think about, uh, to uh, 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 about priorities that uh, it, it, this deepening relationship should be focused on. And I think uh, with that, I think we've achieved our goals. Uh, we asked them some questions that require further uh, uh, discussions for answers, but uh, I think uh, uh, as we always do in the similar conferences uh, last uh, decade, we uh, in a sense do the status update on the US-Georgian uh, partnership and, and uh, uh, strategic position of Georgia and its neighborhood. And I think uh, we managed to do that. Uh, we know uh, where we are today in these uh, in this, uh, discussions and in these uh, developments. And we hope next year we'll have an opportunity to all of us to get together in person uh, and continue this discussion, uh, hopefully with some of the uh, priorities already achieved and some of the other priorities in progress. So I would like to thank everybody, 
first of all, obviously, our keynote speakers, Deputy Secretary Stephen Began, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Georgia, David Zalkaliani, two ambassadors, uh, Ambassador Degnan, Ambassador Bakradze, and all the speakers. And uh, thank Tina Mikeladze and the Van Mikeladze Foundation for partnership in this, in this uh, conference and project. And hope to see you all soon in person. And meanwhile, drink Georgian wine. One.